The power of God is going to happen right now. I think uh, we're going to get some things worked out. So here it is. I want you to open your Bibles to uh, John chapter 5. Please go to John chapter 5. And as you're turning your Bibles to John chapter 5, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever asked somebody a question and they never really answered the question? They gave you some form of a, 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 as an answer, but they never fully answered the question that was asked. Can I, can I get a, a show of hands? Anybody that, I apologize for these flags blocking you guys away. Can, uh, these are blocking the corners, but that's okay. We'll put the flags in the back. So I want to make sure that everybody on this side can see and everybody on that side can see. Can you tell I'm a little OCD, everybody, you know? I'm just a little OCD. Just a little hypersensitive in terms of the spiritual things and the technology things. But anyway, if I look at, I've, I've asked, like, for instance, Clint Shannon, okay, one of my, I call him over the top Clint. He's over the top. He's, you ask him to do something, he goes above and beyond. He's over the top. He's above and beyond. Uh, he is a, a Ephesians chapter 3, 20 man right here in the front row. That's Clint Shannon. We're at camp, and I ask him, I, I, need a, I need a big coffee, I need a venti, okay, because it's a long day and I need a venti. He comes in one of those Starbucks cartons, you know the big one? And he <laughs> shows up with that. And I'm going, dude, I don't need this much coffee. Well, you'll give me a heart attack or something. That's, he figured, I think you want more coffee throughout the day. That's Clint. He's above and beyond, right? Anything you could ever ask for, hope for, or imagine. But the thing that I love about Clint, but the thing that I also frustrates me about Clint, can I tell you guys it's okay? Can you, he can handle this. Some of my staff can't handle this. I want you to know this. He can handle this. Sometimes I'm going, Clint, answer the question. Clint, can you please answer the question? There's a condition for this. He doesn't necessarily have this condition, but what you'll find is it's called either deflection or diversion. We're not comfortable with the question at this moment. We're having a hard time answering this question. We're, we're, we're challenged with this because it can either be because uh, we are discomfort, we have discomfort with the topic, we are insecure about it, or a desire to actually control the conversation. We do it knowingly and we do it unknowingly. I do it to Lisa probably every once in a while. Lisa's like, Mike, can you please answer the question? I answered the question. I think I might, might be speaking a little bit too high, and let me bring it down. No, I'm just kidding. I joke around with her and stuff like that. But here's what happens. In this text tonight, what we're going to see is a question is being asked, and the person is not answering the question. Have you ever been in this situation in life where you're listening to something, but the, not, the right questions are not being asked of your life? The Bible tells us in John chapter 20, for the reason why we have this gospel of John, why John wrote it, it says that, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you have life by the power of his name. That's why these things were written. So when we go through the gospel of John, we're going through the gospel of John, and number one, we see the word becomes flesh. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was, was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In, in part two of our sermon, we find out about the calling of the very first disciples on how God, Jesus, calls the first disciples. Lisa preached on that. Lisa talked about how God called her, and just through simple obedience of saying, Yes, God, I'm available. I'll do children's ministry. And from children's ministry, just serving in a classroom, she turned out to be the director of the children's ministry. And before you know it, she ended up being with me. And then before you know it, we became the youth pastors and the senior pastors. It's not because we knew a pathway to become a senior pastor. We didn't know what the pathway was. It was just by an obedience to saying yes to God every single step of the way. So if you want to know God's purpose for your life, it is often found in just saying yes through simple obedience to God. Somebody say amen. amen. Before I even continue, I just want to thank all of our Kingdom Men ministry guys, the guys that put on the camp. Can we give them a hand, everybody? You might not have attended, and that's okay. That's okay. You can come to the next one. You might have been at the other one. But I'm telling you, every time we do camp, these guys put it out there every single time. It was absolutely phenomenal. So in John chapter 5, we find... A question that is being answered, and the answer is not what Jesus is actually fishing for. It says in verse 1, it says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. And inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, they lay on the porches. And one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him, wait, wait, pause, 38 years? 
He's got a condition for 38 years, and he's sitting at the same spot for 38 years. Then it says this, and one of the men lying there had been there for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. And instantly the man was healed. The man was healed instantly. Then it says, but this miracle happened on the Sabbath, right? So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry the sleeping mat. That's not working, everybody. So, but he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. And who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now that you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse will happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Jesus who had healed him. 38 years, this man is lame. This man cannot walk for 38 years. He's in the same spot. Tonight's message is called, that's not what I asked you. That's not what I asked you. Think about this for a moment. This poor man, we don't know what his condition was. We don't know how he gets sick. We don't know, um, but we do know biblical scholars would say, and even Jewish, uh, Jewish theologians would say, that if you were sick, there was something wrong with you. You had sinned. You're, you're, you're sick because you have sinned. Maybe it was your mom and dad that sinned. Maybe your parents have sinned. And that's why maybe you are crippled. Maybe you are lame from birth. Is what your, it, sin must be the problem. Someone in your life sinned. Can you imagine this entire pool filled with people during this festival? That there are people, people from all kinds of ailments, all kinds of problems. It says that they're paralyzed. They were lame, sick people, blind people all over the pool waiting to get in as soon as the water is stirred up. And when the water becomes stirred up, then the first one in the pool is the lucky person. And that year, they get to get the healing. For 38 years, there are 38 winners, everybody. 38 years, 38 winners. And this man is not one of those men. Must be a very difficult time back in those days when you think about it. If they blamed everything on sin, everything was based upon sin, oh, Something happened tragically in your family. Well, somebody must be sinning in your family. That was the old religious way of thinking. And I still find it in Hawaii to this day. Oh, it must be sin. Oh, it must be this, must be that. Uh uh. Sometimes we don't even know the reason. Only God knows the reason. Sometimes only God will know the reason. We can't bring up the explanation. It could have been an accident. It could have been genetic. We don't know, but only God truly knows the answer to these problems. It was done during a particular Jewish festival. That Jewish festival was called Purim, P-U-R-I-M. Some called it Purim or Purina Kachau. No, just kidding, Purim, okay? Purim. And during Purim, this is when they celebrated Esther, when Esther had stood up with Mordecai for the Jews and rescued the people of Israel in Persia. And it is during this festival that this is actually happening. And while this is happening, the poor guy is waiting for his turn to get healed. And he says his answer to Jesus. Jesus asks him one question. says, do you want to be healed? And he says, I can't. Not, he asked him a yes or no question. It was a yes or no. And he says that I cannot. I find it very, very interesting because point number one, I want you to write this down in your notes. Before you, actually, before you do that, I want to read you verse 4 of the New King James Version. It's interesting. It says, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water that whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever d- disease that they had. Stepped in first. If you were the first one, can you imagine this sea of humanity? at the pool of Bethesda, waiting for their opportunity, waiting. Man, you don't want to use the bathroom. You ever been there before? Man, I don't want to go use the bathroom if I come back. You know what I'm saying? The Lakers might make a comeback. You know what I'm saying? Like I care about the Lakers, but I just want to relate to some people in the room here today. Right? I I, I, I don't want to leave 
I don't want to leave. There's the presence of God is so powerful. My wife was saying at a Rise conference that went on for hours that she did not want to leave, but she had to use the bathroom really badly. And she left, but she was afraid that if she left, if she would come back, that that would have come to an end. You know what I'm talking about? There are times that you don't. Can you imagine these people? I would imagine that nobody wanted to leave. Nobody wanted to exit that place. They wanted to wait because you never know when the angel is going to show up during the time of Purim for 38 years. That angel only comes once a year. This, this myth that people believe, they were believing this. And when we look at what was happening here, it's interesting because I want you to write down four principles to walking in freedom. Number one, it's never too hard and it's never too late. If you think, I missed the boat, oh, I missed my opportunity, I can tell you right now, no, 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 God is the God that can always bring an opportunity if you allow him to do what only he can do. If you are obedient to him, if you have a willing heart, if you are a willing vessel, I want you to know that it's never too hard and it's never too late. He said, would you like to get well? He said, I can't, sir, I can't, because I can't get in fast enough. I can't get in fast enough. See, wholeness Wholeness is not found in a myth. Wholeness is not found in a method. Wholeness is found in the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. This is where we get our wholeness. And for 38 years, the same way that the children of Israel wandered the desert for 40 total years, 38 on top of rejecting the plan that God had them for them to go into the promised land. I have to ask you a question tonight. Is there something that you've been battling for three years, for eight years, for 38 years that you think you can't get healed from, that you think you can't get delivered from? I'm telling you right now, God is, you have never, God is never too late and what God wants to deal with in your life. It is never too hard in Jesus' name. If you believe it, give God five seconds of praise in the house today. It might be for your mother-in-law, it might be for your cousin, it might be for your son or your daughter, but it is never too late, never too late. The question, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, do we want it bad enough? Do we want God to heal our marriage bad enough? Do we want God to heal our physical body, heal something in our lives bad enough? But we find three different things that happen. Number one, we, we got excuses. We will always have an excuse why it cannot work, why we are different. Oh, it's, we're, we're different though. Our circumstance is different and it's not going to work for us, but maybe for somebody else it's going to work. But I don't know, our circumstances are different. Maybe it won't work for us. Or maybe, 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 maybe some people say, well, counseling, I, 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 don't, I mean, you can go to marriage counseling, but I don't think we're going to go to marriage counseling. Hey, if you don't get yourself up that, off, that, uh, off the pool, man, I'm telling you right now, if you don't roll yourself into that pool, ain't nothing going to happen with your marriage. It doesn't just get better by osmosis. It doesn't just get better. You're not going to get pixie that's sprinkled over your marriage. And all of a sudden, you wake up and say, you know what? I think we can work this out. You know, it actually is not going to get any better. You're going to live a life of quiet desperation unless someone gets into the water. Who's going to be the adult? Who's going to be the adult in their conversation and in their mind and say, I'm going into the water whether you come in or not. I'm going into the water. I praise God. Lisa went into the water first. I'm just kidding. No, no. We needed marriage counseling. We needed counseling. We, 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 maybe every once in a while we need a coach, like a coach. I like to call him a coach because it's a safer word. Uh, I don't like a counselor. I don't know. Counselors, they, counselors seem to be, never mind. I'm just going to move, move right along. <laughs> Think about this. Excuses. Excuses are often followed by, it's not my fault. It's not my fault I'm this way. It's not, uh, my, it's not my fault we're like this. It's not my fault we're living like this. It's not my fault. It's not. And whenever we don't take responsibility, at least for what we can, or at least for what we can, we'll never get the healing that God wants us to have. But God wants you to have healing. There are no, expect, no exceptions. Here's the second one. Number one is excuses. Number two, it's effort. Effort. The effort. Do you want to be made well? What is your infirmity or what is the weakness that you might have? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it mental? Right? Was he comfortable after 38 years being the way that he was? This is my life for 38 years. Call it 18 years. Call it eight years. Are you comfortable like that, the way that it is right now? Or do you want to do something different? If it was me, if it was me, I would be by the pool, lying right this. I'd be ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. When it's my turn, man, it's re- I'm so ready. I am. So- I'm ready. No, 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 no. This is my side, brother. This is my side. Go, 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 go. Get over here. Hey, 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 I need room for my head, huh? I need room for my head. Hey, 
I would be lying right by the pool. The pool would be right here. And as soon as I seen that angel come like this with his finger, as soon as I'd, see that, I'd be like that, you know what I would do? I'd be like this. Bam! Right into the water. That's what I would have done. You got to put some effort into it. You got to put some effort into it. But what I've found sometimes is some people don't want to get healed of their affliction. It draws attention. Can you, you know how many pastors and leaders are talking to me now? Because now all of a sudden, do you know what I'm going through right now? Do you understand? And, and sometimes people, I've seen this, that people like the attention and they're not willing to make the effort to take up their bed, their mat, and go on and start walking. You have to put in some effort. Number one is excuses. I used to make a lot of excuses. Well, I was a single, I was a single dad for a, long, for a couple of years. Yeah, I went through a really tough time, okay? You know, I was, I, was, I was picked on when I was younger. I went through all the... I could, I could drop excuse after excuse of why I shouldn't have succeeded in life. I can tell you, I came from a small town. Mike, if you only knew, I was picked on a lot. I was. I was. But then I grew, and I turned vigilante and beat everybody up. No, just kidding. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Until Jesus came into my life. Until Jesus came into my life. Until Jesus had to come into my life. I got all kinds of excuses I could use for you, but they won't work anymore. They don't work anymore. They don't work at 55. They work right around at 25, but once you're older than 25, they don't work anymore. I just want you to know. Effort. If you don't put in the effort, if you don't put in the effort, it was really God that was doing the healing, but the effort on his part, I, he didn't answer the question. I really can't. No, 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 I didn't ask you if you can or you can't. I asked you if you want to. Do you want to be healed? Third thing that I found that stops us from getting healed or whatever God wants to do to, for us to walk in freedom is number three, is our experiences. Our experience. It could be our old religious experiences, our past experiences with another denomination or another church. Well, I grew up in that kind of environment. I know all about that. Oh, yeah. Woo, Pentecostal flags in the place. You know, people running around like that. I tried that before. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what it means to speak in tongues. I understand. Yeah, I got a little bit. I got a little bit of that or whatever. And sometimes it's our past experiences that stop us from Jesus coming into heal healing us. I also found that sometimes no experience, no experience. Like, no, I, I don't even know what that's like, but it seems kind of scary. So I don't want that. The no experience. It's interesting because Bethesda actually means house of mercy the pool of the house of mercy that God wants to heal that God wants to bring a deliverance number one it's never too hard and it's never too late come on somebody say amen to that amen. here's number two number two we find it in verse eight Jesus told him stand up pick up your mat and walk and instantly the man was healed and he rolled up his sleeping mat and he began walking he began walking he rolled it up and he began walking and sometimes you got to get out of that environment that's killing your faith or putting faith into the wrong thing. They were waiting for an angel. They were waiting. It's interesting. He was waiting for an angel to stir the water. And when Jesus comes up to him, he don't even know it's Jesus. He doesn't even recognize who Jesus is. But what he was looking at was the living water. Come on, somebody. He was the living water who was greater than an angel who didn't need to stir up the water. He said, just pick up your mat. You don't even need that water. You don't even need that pool. Anybody else can have that pool, but I want to heal you right now in my name, and I want you to grab your sleeping bag, grab your Hello Kitty pillow, and get out of here in Jesus' name. Sorry about the Hello Kitty stuff. I apologize for yelling. Pikachu, whatever your, whatever your flavor is. Marvel Comics, anyway, your pillow. Anyway, here it is. Are you guys okay? Yeah. Okay, I just, I'm just making sure you guys are. It feels quiet tonight. I don't know what it is. Is it me needing more feedback for some reason? Here it is. Number one, it's never too hard, and it's never too late. Okay, here's number two. Get up, get out, and you got to get moving. Yeah. You got to get moving. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you are stuck in a plateau of life. Been there, done that. Been there before, periodically. Stuck in the doldrums where you are at the part of the equator where there is no wind and there's barely any current and you're stuck. And it takes a lot of effort to get yourself going in the right direction. 
But when you get up and you change up a routine, you do something different, you never know. You got to get, get up out of that mat. You got to get up out of that bed. You got to get off of that lazy boy recliner. You got to get out of that couch. You got to get out of watching all that YouTube. You got to get out of all that Netflix and chilling. Come on. You got to be able to do, go get something done in your life in the name of Jesus. Here's number three. Number three says check your heart before you check the boxes. Check your heart before you check the boxes. Look at what happens. This is crazy. Okay? He gets healed. He picks up his mat. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. According to Jewish law, nothing can happen on the Sabbath, really. You can't do anything. You can't do anything. And this is where the Pharisees actually begin to get Jesus is because of right here at this moment right here. This point right here. Ah, oh, now we have to crucify him because he broke Sabbath tradition. The Sabbath. He broke the Sabbath tradition. It happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected and they said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry a sleeping mat. Sometimes we can be so heavenly, you heard it before, heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Sometimes we can be so religious in our mindset, so, what, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm looking for legalistic. Legalistic. Oh, no, he didn't do everything correctly. He didn't even, uh, it's interesting. This, that at the, at, uh, oof, yeah, yeah, the camp was awesome. It was so awesome. And, and I want to make sure he's not in the room today. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say anything. We'll find another illustration. Uh, you know when someone gets, seems to be very religious toward you, just religious, like not, not, not authentic, right? Not genuine, but very religious. And the guy came up to me and said, I would love to wash your feet, pastor. I'm like, no, ain't nobody washing my feet. No, <laughs> no. if they do, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to get, you know, no, just kidding. Not, nobody wash, nobody's washing my feet. And I thought it was still a nice gesture, but it's religious to me. Like, I've washed feet before. I've washed people on the, the church staff before. I've done it on the, on, on the stage before. But I can tell you that there are times where I thought it was a re very religious. It was checking the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. And God doesn't want you to come and check the box at church. He's glad. I'm glad. And I'm sure he's glad that you're here. And I'm glad that you're here. But we have to more do a heart check before we do a box check. Look at this. They said, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to do that. They were legalistic telling him, you got to check the boxes. You didn't check the boxes. I know you got your healing. I know your life has changed forever. I know for 38 years you were lying by the pool. I know for 38 years, every single year, someone else got healed, not you. But just for the sake of things, you can't carry around your mat on a Sabbath even if you got your miracle today. How crazy does that sound? Sounds amazing. And here it is. The Bible tells us, but afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Jesus catches him in the temple later on and tells him, stop sinning. Can I get the, the um, worship team to come up for a moment right now? We'll just come up now. And he says, stop sinning. We're all wondering, what is his sin? What did he do? Why did Jesus tell him this? Why? Is he doing this? What was the sin? For 38 years, he'd been accused of being sinful because he was disabled. Now he could walk. He was being accused of being sinful for carrying his mat home. All he could think about was proclaiming the innocence, his own innocence, and escaping without punishment. And you know what he does? He throws Jesus under the bus. That's what he does. He throws Jesus under the bus, and he says, the man who healed me told me to carry my mat. It was self-centeredness. And Jesus sees him in the temple and he says, hey, brah, I just healed you. You better stop sinning or something worse is going to happen to you. Something worse is going to happen to you. I think it's profound that he was concerned about saving himself, taking for granted all that was done for him. So Jesus found him and probably saved him again from himself. When I look at this passage of Scripture, the biggest thing that stands out to me is this is what he says. It's not the religious rules of the Pharisees. It's not about 
throwing Jesus under the bus. It is the most important part where he says, I can't. When you say, I can't, we're often saying, God can't. God can't heal me of depression and anxiety. God can't heal me from this pornography addiction. God can't intervene in my marriage. God can't save my children. Because whenever we're saying, I can't, we're saying, I don't think God can. There are no exceptions. I want you to know that God can. No matter what you've been through, God can. I don't know if I can forgive. Yes, you can because God has. Yes, you can because God has. I, I, I don't know if I can ever marry again. No, no, no. You can. You can. You can learn to trust again. You can learn to give your heart again. You can learn that. I don't know if we can ever have kids. I want you to know that you repeat those words. Don't keep saying those words. Don't keep saying those words. We can't have children. Who said you can't have children? A doctor with authority in his voice? I love doctors. I, I use them all the time. But that, that, just that position of authority said you'll never have kids. Who was it? Was it Obi Who was it? Don't receive those things. Don't, don't speak those things. I'll never get free from marijuana. I will never get free from meth. Don't say those words. You can because if God has set you free or if the son he who sets the son free set, can set you free indeed. God can heal every single person in this room in his timing. In his timing. So I'm, I'm, I'm landing the plane earlier. Here's why. Not so, you, not, not, not so we can go to dinner earlier because no. Because I want to pray for people tonight. But then I want to tell you about Sunday night. Because on Sunday night, you come back. You come back and you bring family and friends who need a healing. Because they're not in the room here today. And if you want a double dose, come back on Sunday night. But Pastor Benny Perez will be here on Sunday night at 6 p.m. Am I right? 6 p.m. 5.30 p.m.? 5.30 p.m. He will be here. He's going to be here. He's going to do a revival, healing, prophecy night. And I want you to come because it's going to blow your mind. It is powerful. Come on, how many of the men were at the camp this week? Let me see your hands. It was powerful, right? It was awesome. How many of you, how many of you ever been to a revival, and ref, uh, a revival night here, a revival and a healing night in this room here today? Awesome. The rest of you, if you've never experienced, get here on 5.30 on Sunday night and come 5.15, come 5 o'clock because this place, I promise you, will be packed. All of the men that went to camp, they are coming back. They're coming back. So be here on, on Sunday night. It's going to be powerful. So I want us to bow our heads and pray. Then I'm going to pray for people just, just for, I'm not going to do it long. I just want to pray. Father, we just come before you today in the name of Jesus. And God, we need you now more than ever before. We need you to touch people, God. We need areas of our lives that need healing. And God, when we say, I can't, God, we're saying you can. But tonight we're going to say you can, God, that you can. And that you are able, Lord God, to bring healing to bring deliverance into our life, to set us free, to, to bring reconciliation to us, to draw us into your purpose, to be able, Lord, to allow us to settle our hearts and where we live and where we're at right now, Lord. I know you can do those things. And so, Lord, we offer this time up to you and we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 Now, in order to get healed sometimes, you have to reveal so God can heal. If you don't reveal, often God won't heal. So to reveal means admit. I will admit that I need God to heal. And if that's you today, that if you, want, you need God to heal, I'm going to do the unconventional stuff. You need God to heal a broken heart. No matter if someone died, no matter if someone left, no matter if something happened to you, that you feel like you've been carrying around this wound for over a year, you feel like you have a broken heart, so to speak. I want you to raise your hand in this room, and I'm going to pray for that right now. You feel like you have that? You feel like you have that, okay? You feel like you have that, okay, good. You feel like that's happening, yeah, okay, okay. Anybody else? You feel like that it's part of your heart? Okay, I want you to raise your hand. Keep your hand raised right now. I want someone to put your hand on their shoulder right now if you're right close next to them. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord. And there is a medical condition for this. There is a medical condition for this where someone's 
part of their quadrant of their heart has, has suffered because of tragedy or stress that has happened, Lord. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would heal that part of their heart. They felt it tingle when it happened. They felt that part of their heart tingle because I had it happen to me. It tingled in that one quadrant of my heart. And then God brought healing to my heart. I'm praying the healing power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you now in Jesus' name. And God, I pray, Lord, that you'd restore that area of people's hearts right now, that you would bring healing to it, that you would touch it, God, that you would grow new tissue around it right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, they'd be able to have joy again. They'd be able to love again. They'd be able to laugh again, God, that you'd bring that into their lives right now, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. We pray these things. Lord, trust you knowing that it is by the blood of Jesus. It is the only way that this heart can be healed in Jesus' name. So, Lord, we offer it up to you. We offer it up to you. We thank you, Lord God, that you are healing hearts all over this room. Father, you are healing hearts of a death of a parent, of a loved one, or um, you feel like there's a death of, a, of something that's happened in your life right now, that God is... God may not bring that back to life for sure, but God can also bring healing and bring life back into your heart again in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can put your hand down. Amen. Amen. Come on. Can we thank the Lord? Because I believe, I believe healing's happening. I, I forget the name of that, that disease. It's a Japanese name. It's a Japanese name of that part of your heart that, is, that has suffered from from a traumatic event in your life. I wish I remembered it. I did preach on it one time. Yeah? Do you remember the name? No, I don't either. Anyway, but God can do it. He knows the name. Come on, somebody. He knows the name. We don't even need to name it. Come on, we cancel that name anyway in the name of Jesus. Amen? See, that's the problem. We're always naming our conditions. We're always trying to find a name for our condition. I understand they have to categorize that, but we don't need a name for the condition. All we need to know is the name above all names. Come on, and his name is Jesus. Amen? Amen. Um, I want you to come back for the healing prayers, for the physical healing prayers on, on Sunday night. The unconventional prayer was, number one, was the healing of hearts. Here's the other one. I'm going to do this one. This is not unconventional. Restoration and solidification of marriage. Now here, before you raise your hand, what I mean is this. What I mean is you might be here by yourself because your spouse didn't come because they're working. Or you might be here by yourself because they did not want to come to church today. Or you might be here with them today and you know that you need to come to church because it's what you do and you believe the only person that can really heal you is going to be Jesus. But you know that you've got to roll yourself into that pool. Somebody's got to take a step and go call a counselor and go make this happen even if you're on a waiting list for four to six months because that's what's going on right now. People need help. And you can only get healed by what you reveal. Now I want you to know that every person that has been married in this room here today has not had a smooth year since, since year one. Everybody has struggled in this place here today. Everybody. If, 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 if I meet the perfect couple that never had an argument, I, I'd say I, I'd quit what I do <laughs> and, and find out what you're doing and do what you're doing. But you know what? Lisa and I have had our struggles before. And it wasn't until pride was let down by one or both of us until God could heal what we revealed. Sometimes healing is a process. It's not one session. It's not one prayer. Sometimes we go one session. Never work. We went counseling. Never work. She's not going to change. Or he's, or he's not changing. No, no, no. We went seven times. Seven times. It was like terrible. It was like nobody wanted to give in. Well, did you try the eighth? You know what I'm saying? Okay, if that's you, God can't heal what He wants, but God can heal what He wants to, what, what you're willing to reveal. Okay? And nobody's looking at you with judging eyes, like, oh, look at them. They get, they're having problems. No, we don't care. We care, but we don't care. We care more than you think we care. But at the end of the day, I don't care whose hand goes up. That's up to you. Okay? So if you feel they both need to go up at the same time, grab her hand, grab his hand right now, and grab it and put it up in the air at the count of three. One, grab your own hand. Put your two hands in the air if you have to. 
at the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Put your hand in the air. Put your hand in the air. Come on. Put them up. God can heal what you're willing to reveal. All right. Let me pray. Let me pray. Let me pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we, can, we believe that sometimes we don't need a session. That we believe that you can do it at one point at one time. But Lord, we are dealing with two different individuals here today. Not one person. And Lord, we believe that you can hit us both at the same time. But God, would you please change me before you change her? Would you please change me before you change him? God, would you please work the change in me so that I could be that what you called me to be so we could have the marriage that you called us to have so we could live the life that you called us to live Lord God and then we would pass on a generation and a legacy to our children and our grandchildren that will be a legacy of, of, of resiliency in marriage and in love in the name of Jesus so Father I pray right now in Jesus name Lord that you'd begin to smooth over the rough edges of our lives and Father that you'd begin to bring healing the power of the Holy Spirit into our hearts right now Father help us to be patient loving Lord help us to to live lives the way that you called us to do Lord help us to lay down our own lives at the same time for the sake of our loved ones and Lord we ask right now Father in the name of Jesus Lord God that you would bring down pride on both sides and a loving heart towards one another. And Father, I pray, Lord, that husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, to lay down their lives with the gift of agape that you've given, the agape love that you gave to us. And Lord, I pray, I pray that our wives, their wives would be respectful and honoring. Another word is submitting to their husbands as one to the Lord. But Father, I pray that we would live up to this, Lord God, as we are given it. So we bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Can okay, we thank the Lord? Thank the Lord. I want to say this. Whatever you're going through, do not quit. Do not quit. God, I tried church. It didn't work. I tried God. It didn't work. No, 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 no. This is a journey. This is a journey. God's got a journey for you. Don't ever quit your relationship with God. Don't ever quit put your relationship with Jesus Christ or his bride which is called the church you keep on powering through and you keep on reading your Bible and believing by faith and God is raising up a resilient generation the older generation is getting more resilient the younger generation is getting more resilient because they're believing that God can even though we think we can't God can come on say God can say it again say God can thank you say God can and if you believe he can he will can I get an amen Amen. Let's close the service. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for all that you're doing in our hearts today. We bless you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Keep your eyes closed. And I got to pray. My, I got to do this one last prayer. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you would like the forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life in heaven, you realize there's only two places. There's a heaven and there is a hell. There's no purgatory. There's no in-between. There is no reincarnation. You're not coming back as anything else. You get one shot at this life and then comes eternity and then comes the judgment. And, 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 and if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've never done it before, or if you feel like you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, at the count of three, from the front row to the top row, from my far right side, to my left side beyond the flags. And no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, then at the count of three, I want you to get ready to raise your hand. Come on, get ready. Here we go. He wants to come into your heart, forgive you. It is by his blood, his shed blood on that cross on Calvary. Over 2,000 years ago, that the Lord has forgiven our sins, but we have to accept the gift. The gift must be opened. It's not a gift of Christmas that just sits under the tree 20, 365 days a year. You must go and accept that gift and open it and receive that. And that's what he has for you. So at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. If that's what you want, I want you to raise your hand. And he's going to come into your heart. He's going to take residence. You'll never be the same again. It's not going to be easy, but it'll be absolutely worth it. All right, get ready. One, two. One, two, three. If that's you, put up your hand right now. Put up your hand right now if that's you. Says, Mike, that's what I want. I want Christ in my life. I want one right there, two right there, three right here. God bless you. Four right there, my brother. Four, five. I see you at the top. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten right there. God bless you. Ten. Anybody else? Ten. Come on. Ten. And Eleven. And twelve right there. Thirteen. Fourteen right here. Wow. I'm glad I did it. Fifteen right there. And sixteen right there. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Seventeen right there, sir. I see you. 
Awesome. Come on. Everybody, you can put your hands down. And we're going to pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, come on. Can we thank the Lord before we pray, everybody? Oh. I want you to say these words. Say it with me. Say, Jesus, this afternoon, I surrender my life to you. And I thank you that you died on that cross, shed your blood that washes my sins as white as snow. Thank you that when I die, I'll be in your presence for all eternity. But while I'm here, be my strength, my hope, my provision, my provider for all things. When I read the Bible, may it come alive. May the words leap off the page when I pray and believe that you're there. And then may I know your presence. And may I hear your still small voice. Will you help me to grow roots in my faith that when the storm comes, I'll be able to stand firm, building my house on solid rock, not shifting sand. Help me to overcome the thoughts of the culture, the way the world thinks, and to set my mind on things that are pure and lovely and praiseworthy. Help me to overcome all that is before me and lead me into the right paths so that I live the life that you called me to live and make a difference in my world. I'm born again. The old is past. The new has begun. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, created to serve you and to bring you glory. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.